Welcome to this ECE 201 video lesson titled Time Response of RLC Circuits. We will be considering a circuit as shown here on the board where we have a time varying voltage source, a resistor, an inductor, and capacitor. And I'd like to point out that our results may be generalized beyond this particular circuit that we see here in the sense that the voltage source and resistor may represent a Thevenin equivalent of a much more complicated circuit to which are connected an inductor and a capacitor. We are going to be talking about current through the inductor or whatever circuit parameter, but for today let's start by looking at V sub C. The techniques that we use will be the old standbys, connection constraints, that is Kirchhoff's current law and voltage law, and also the laws that the elements themselves bring. And let's begin by assigning parameters. The voltage parameters, say V sub R, the inductor voltage. Once we have the reference signs for the voltages, we'll use passive sign notation so we can talk about I sub R, and of course I sub L, and I sub C. That's the problem we're setting up for ourselves, and now let's begin applying the connection constraints and element constraints to solving for the variables, in particular for the capacitor voltage. So here's the circuit we had on the board. Along with an expression of Kirchhoff's voltage law, let's go around the loop starting below the voltage source clockwise. So we have minus Vs plus V sub R plus V sub L plus V sub C is equal to zero. And Kirchhoff's current law, well, all the elements are in series, so all the currents are equal to one another. Well, those were the connection constraints. Now let's add the constraints on current and voltage that the elements themselves bring to the table. The resistor says V equals IR, the inductor has V equals L di dt, and the capacitor current is equal to C dVc dt, first derivative of voltage with respect to time. Now by KCL we noted that all the currents are equal, so we can just refer to a current I that flows through all the elements. For the resistor then, V sub R is just that current I times R. For the inductor, V is equal to L times the first derivative of that current with respect to time. And we can use those terms in KVL now as we see on the fourth line. I times R plus L di dt plus V sub C is equal to the source voltage. For the next step, please take a look at the equation on the bottom of this slide. Now, one thing we haven't used yet is the capacitor constraint on current and voltage, namely I equals C times dVc dt. So let's do that now. I times R then becomes C, dVc dt times R. L times di dt becomes L times the first derivative of C, dVc dt. And note that taking the derivative of the derivative yields a second order derivative. And finally then when we collect terms we indeed arrive at a second order differential equation that can be solved for the capacitor voltage if we have sufficient information about the circuit. Namely, we need to know the values of R, L, and C. We need to know the voltage source time dependence. And we would also need to know any initial conditions of the state variables. In order to focus on the RLC nature of things, suppose we consider first the case of no voltage source. Now, since R, L, and C are passive devices, one might well wonder how this could be of interest without a source of energy, such as a voltage source or current source. But recall that a capacitor has the ability to store energy, one half C, V, C squared. Likewise, inductors, one half L times I squared. So, let's say at time t equals zero, the capacitor and or inductor have stored energy. Then, for t greater than zero, we could consider the natural response of the currents and voltages in the circuit as a result of that stored energy. With V sub s equal to zero, the right-hand side of the differential equation is zero. And for that type of equation, the solutions are the form k e to the s t, where t is time, s is a constant that depends on the values of r, l, and c, and k depends on the initial conditions. And substituting k times e to the s t for the capacitor voltage, we obtain an s squared from the second derivative term, we obtain an s from the first derivative, 
and then dividing both sides of the equation through by k e to the st, we are left with a quadratic equation for s. Lc times s squared plus r times c times s plus 1 equals 0. And using the standard quadratic equation solution to find s, we obtain the two roots from minus rc plus or minus the square root of rc squared minus 4lc, all over 2 times the product l times c. Mathematically, both s1 and s2 are valid solutions of the equation, and that was obtained from KCL, KVL, and element constraints, so either solution would satisfy our circuit requirement. The most general form, then, of the answer can be written as a weighted summation of the two possible solutions. In other words, the capacitor voltage equal to K1 e to the S1t plus another constant K2 e to the S2t. We should examine the nature of the possible values of S1 and S2. One possibility shown here is that the quantity in the square root is positive. In that case, both values of S are real, but S1 and S2 are not equal to one another. This is described as an overdamp circuit, and we'll see the reasoning behind that nomenclature just a little later. A second possibility is that the quantity RC squared equals the quantity 4LC. In that case, the square root vanishes. S1 and S2 are equal to one another. And they are real numbers. This circuit is said to be critically damped. And a third possibility occurs when the quantity RC squared is less than 4LC. This corresponds to an RLC circuit with a smaller value of R. Now S1 and S2 have both a real and an imaginary component. They are complex numbers that are not equal to one another. This is called an underdamp circuit. Let's consider here three numerical examples, one for each type of dampening. All will have C equal to 1 microfarad and L equal to 100 microhenries. And all will have as the initial conditions that at t equals 0, capacitor voltage is 10 volts, the capacitor current is 0 amps. In each case, we want to track that capacitor voltage as a function of time for t greater than 0. What happens to the capacitor stored energy as time progresses? Now, in the first case, r equals 4 ohms. If you compare the quantity rc squared to the quantity 4lc, you'll see that RC squared is less than 4LC. That's an example of underdampening. In the second case, RC squared equals 4LC. The third case, RC squared exceeds 4LC. Those are the critically damped and overdamped situations. Let's let SPICE do the heavy lifting here and generate the solutions. And here are the results from SPICE, presented in graphical form so that we can move from an equation-based perspective to a visual slash pictorial perspective, and we see that for the small resistor case, that is the underdamp case, the capacitor voltage begins at 10 volts, as it must, that was an initial condition. As time progresses, the capacitor voltage changes, so there's a DVCDT, and so there's a current flowing, and that current's path includes the series inductor. Thus, as the energy in the capacitor, 1 half CV squared, decreases from its starting value, the energy stored in the inductor, 1 half Li squared, increases from its initial value of zero. So energy is being transferred from the capacitor to the inductor. In fact, at a little less than 20 microsecond, V sub C is equal to zero, and there's no energy stored in the capacitor at that point in time. But then V sub C becomes non-zero, Vc squared begins to increase again. It reaches a local maximum of around 35 microseconds. But notice that the capacitor will never again achieve the stored energy it had to start with. That's because energy is lost to the resistor. Associated with the current flow I is power dissipated in the resistor I squared R, and the energy is simply lost as heat. This is, continues as the capacitor inductor trade stored energy. The result is the oscillatory behavior that we see here until essentially all the initial stored energy in the capacitor has been lost to, to the resistor. This oscillatory ringing combined with an overall exponential decay is characteristic of an underdamped response. Now let's turn our attention to the other two cases, overdamped and critically damped. But in both cases, the response is an exponential decay to a final value with no oscillatory behavior. So very large R results in overdampening 
And then as R is decreased, critical dampening occurs just at the edge before oscillatory behavior results. Any small reduction in R and we would see oscillation. But the critical dampening provides the quickest return to equilibrium. I should mention here probably that if the source part of the circuit had been represented as a Norton equivalent, that is a current source in parallel with the resistor, i.e. as opposed to the Thevenin equivalent, and if an inductor and capacitor are connected in parallel to the Norton equivalent, then applying KVL, KCL, and Ohm's law and so forth results in a second order equation for inductor current with LC times the second derivative of I with respect to time plus L over R times the first derivative of I with respect to time plus the inductor current is equal to the source current. If we again set the source to zero in order to focus on the natural response of this RLC circuit with initial values of stored energy, we will obtain a familiar looking quadratic equation with slightly different terms, but we're on familiar ground. Applying KVL, KCL, and Ohm's law and so forth to the parallel RLC circuit again results in a second order differential equation for which the roots to the characteristic equation are shown here. And there are again three possibilities. Quantity L over R squared greater than 4LC, that's overdamped. Quantity L over R squared equal to 4LC, that's critically damped. And when the quantity L over R squared is less than 4LC, again we see an underdamped situation with the ringing. So in summary, for the series RLC circuit, if RC squared quantity is greater than 4LC, it's overdamped. If the quantity RC squared is equal to 4LC, the circuit is critically damped. And if the quantity RC squared is less than 4LC, we have an underdamped circuit. And for the parallel RLC circuit, if the quantity L over R squared is greater than 4LC, it's overdamped. L over R squared equal to 4LC, that's critically damped. And again, if L over R quantity squared is less than 4LC, we have an underdamped response. And this concludes our ECE 201 lesson titled Time Variation of RLC Circuits. Thank you for watching.